Good afternoon. This is Dr. Dan Guerra coming to you from Vera Med Studios in combination with our new system known as Authentic Biochemistry. That's the new podcast I launched. And now, from now on, I'm going to be doing these video and podcast presentations in combination with both of my uh, systems. Um, and so you can find me with Authentic Biochemistry on any podcast platform that you might want to look at, including iTunes. Uh, uh, these are not going to be duplicated, these video lectures won't, but you can find my audio lectures there. and They're all unique. Today, I'm going to combine, though, uh, discussions from that series to the ones I've been covering most recently in the Vera Med uh, video lectures. But basically, we've been talking about neurodegeneration for quite a while now. And what I want to do is kind of like start to stitch together um, those elements and in such a way that we come to an ultimate understanding at whatever level we can from the scientific literature that has been uh, scrutinized by its evidence and then um, verified via fortification of an understanding of the all the other work that's involved in this area. That's my uh, uh, decision to do that kind of presentation. That's what I do at Vera Med and what I do at Authentic Biochemistry. So this is an excellent um, opportunity for you to see that what I do in action. So let's get started. Uh, all right, so we're going to the slideshow, of course. Yeah, I'm going to hide that. So the topic today is neurodegeneration contributions from the neuroimmune oxylipid mediators epigenome. As you can see from the title, that's going to combine all of the elements of my new paradigm in science called dia event ontology, which I will bring uh, together at the end of this talk. Um, anyways, that's me, Dr. Daniel J. Guerra. Um, that's my email address right there. You can contact me at my email address. You can discuss any of these lectures or anything in authentic biochemistry. Um, and also you can engage uh, uh, as a client of mine if you want me to look into the scientific literature on a topic that you would like more information about, I'd be glad to work with you one-on-one. -on -one. That's what I do for a living these days. Uh, all right, so uh, this will be a really fun talk for me because I'm a lipid biochemist. And again, I've got um, about 30 years experience as a university professor and as a uh, researcher in primarily for the most of my career since the late, my late 20s, um, which was a few years back. Uh, in lipid biochemistry. So this will be a, and plus epigenetics as, as time rolled on. So let's go. All right. Here are some a priori conclusions from the previous talks. Uh, actually, the one most uh, recent that uh, I want to bring to mind here. The data that we were looking at last time, both in authentic biochemistry and now I'm bringing into the Varif Med lecture series, as the data suggests that the amino acid glutamate triggers a decline of intracellular glutathione, and that results in the activation of an enzyme called acid sphingomyelinase, or ASM. And you get an upregulation of the compound sphingosine, which in turn inhibits mitochondrial respiratory chain, leading to the generation of reactive oxygen species because of the partial reduction of molecular oxygen which is part and parcel of the ETC, opening up something called the MPTP, which is basically a transporter across the inner mitochondrial membrane, which we'll hear more about in a moment, and ultimately necrotic cell death, necrosis. The studies provide the experimental evidence supporting the important role of a system called XC. That's where cysteine is imported and glutamate is exported out of the cell. And this particular cell we're talking about is an oligodendrocyte which is dedicated to a neural system, which is ultimately the tissue that becomes neurodegenerative in Alzheimer's disease and other CNS types neurodegenerations. So that XC is a cysteine in the dimer, cysteine of the two cysteine residues made with the disulfide bridge, of course, and then the export of glutamate. So all of that has an important role in that system. It's regula it regulates necrosis in the ligodendrocytes in response to, to exogenous glutamic acid. So glutamate-induced oligodendrocyte demise is prevented by cysteine, indicating that system XC involvement. Secondly, there's a pivotal role for something called SIR3, SIR2, and 3, which is a histone deacetylase and also a basic protein deacetylase, and promoting 
the cer ceramide synthes, ceramide mediated mitochondrial injury. And that leads to apoptosis, certain kind of cell death, which is programmed, which I've covered a lot in the past, in response to cerebral ischemic reperfusion. Okay, that's when oxygen floods back in after an ischemic attack, such as an injury, such as a uh, something to do with uh, any kind of brain injury, okay, traumatic brain injury like a TBI. In contrast, these studies underscore the protective role of CERT-3, that deacetylase, in glutamate-induced acid sphingomyelinase, sphingosine-mediated mitochondrial dysfunction, leading to necrotic cell death. So what I want you to understand is that while CERT-3 promotes ceramide-mediated mitochondrial injury in some aspects of these neurodegenerative pathways. At the same time, CERT-3 is involved in mediating a control over decreasing the amount of necrotic cell death. Okay, So I want you to understand that apoptosis is different than necrosis, and we're going to talk about different kinds of necrosis here very soon, something I Spent quite a bit of time on the last Authentic Biochemistry Lecture uh, podcast. So the evidence suggests that thir CERT-3, that deacetylase, which is now essentially an agent of epigenetics, because when you deacetylate, for example, histone, you alter gene expression without altering the genome. You also can deacetylate proteins in such a way that you modify their activity, and that is essentially can turn into an epigenetic phenomenon if those proteins act as transcription factors or as controlling splice variation, for example, in RNA processing. Also for the synthesis of interfering RNA, and of course, methylation, demethylation, acetylation, deacetylation, even phosphorylation, dephosphorylation of DNA that's regulating the expression of genes. That's all epigenetics. So the evidence suggests that CERT3 is a pleiotropic gene that functions in a stimuli and target substrate-specific manner to control multiple regulated cell death pathways, okay? So, paper recently came out, I mean very recently, like today, because today is indeed the 26th of March, 2019, from Science Signaling, one of my favorite journals. And basically it involves serine, serum, excuse me, serum-free and cell-based enzymatically oxidized phospholipids, okay? serum free and cell-based, enzymatically oxidized phospholipids, okay? Oxidized phospholipids. So these oxidized phospholipids, which are from an enzymatic or origin, are called EOXPLs. And they're generated by lipoxygenases, or LOX enzymes, or cyclooxygenase, COX enzymes. And they're formed during acute responses to injury in multiple innate immune cell types, okay? The EOXPLs form through the coupling of eicosanoid and prostaglandin pathways with the land cycle enzymes, which you'll see in a moment, or by direct enzymatic oxidation of phospholipids. So in other words, what that basically means is that you can generate um, eicosanoids, which are oxygenated fatty acids, and then um, transfer those oxygenated fatty acids back onto a phospholipid backbone, therefore generating enzymatically oxidized phospholipids, or you can oxidize the fatty acid in situ when it's already associated as an oxygen ester on the glycerol molecule in those phospholipids. These are glycerol lipids we're talking about right now. The sphingolipids play a role because they generate ceramide. Different, different pathway, but I just want to make that clear. So the enzymatically oxidized phospholipids are important players in early innate immunity, early innate immunity, which actually plays a very huge role and prodromal Alzheimer's disease, particularly in promoting blood clotting, okay? These, these compounds work on blood clotting and of course in defense against infection because of course it's early innate immunity. So I want you to recall the cell types we're talking about. Myeloid cell lineages originate from a hematopoietic stem cell shown up here, okay? And multipotent progenitor cells which are generated from the stem cell down here. These can then lead to various hematopoietic cell lineages, conventional uh, dendritic cells, uh, common dendritic cell progenitors, common lymphoid progenitors, that's the CLP there. And let's just take a look at that pathway. 
We've got T cells, B cells, and natural killer cells from that common lymphocytic progenitor. Okay. You also have common myeloid lymphoid, uh, myelo lymphoid progenitors shown down here, and that will generate directly the natural killer cell. Okay, we already talked about what CMP is down here. So CMP is a common myeloid progenitor, DC or dendritic cells. Okay, ultimately you're going to generate dendritic cells. Um, GMP is a granulocyte and macrophage progenitor. Okay, um, that's shown uh, here, right? So there's monocytes kind of making macrophages, right? And there's a dendritic cell down there. Uh, MEP is megakerocyte and erythroid progenitors. That's over here making megakerocytes and erythrocytes. And of course, you also have, uh, we already told you what natural killer cells are. The PDs here are plasma cytoid DCs. Okay, it's down here. All right, to give you an idea where this whole cell lineage comes from, I got all this from a paper published in Nature Reviews Immunology um, some seven years ago. It's a very good review paper. All right, here we go with some real detail about lipid peroxidation. All right, are you ready? Oxylipids, oxyphospholipids, are formed by a non-enzymatic oxidation of intact phospholipids in which a hydrogen atom is extracted. See, it's abstracted right there. Boom. Okay. From a bisallelic methylene group, and that's a, this is a bisallelic methylene group, and a polyunsaturated fatty acid forming a lipid alkyl or alkoxy radical. It's all shown here. These are all alkoxy radicals right here. Okay. After the formation of the alkoxy radical, a reaction that's called initiation occurs. Here's various stages of the initiation, also shown here, which is delocalization and oxygen addition. See, that's, that's molecular oxygen, right? Diatomic molecular oxygen with its two lone pair there. And that addition is at diffusion limited rates to form a hydroperoxyl radical, which is this OOH molecule, okay? So you're going to see some of this arising here in these reactions, all right? So here's free radical attack, the hydrogen abstraction, right? There's the phospholipid alkyl radical, and now you're starting to make the peroxyl radical here, and there's the hydroperoxide down here in the propagation phase, okay? That's the, that's the peroxyl. Ultimately, then you make a redox cycling, such as with free iron, that's a two-step electron reduction, and you end up with the formation of a stable non-radical product in the end, just like a typical hydroxide. So this is lipid peroxidation. It's just a primer for showing you get initiation, propagation, and ultimately termination. You get a lot of oxygen radicals that are bound directly to the fatty acid. So when we have an oxophospholipid, these fatty acids themselves are linked via oxygen ester to a glycerol backbone on a membrane-associated phospholipid. All right. So reactive oxygen species generate during inflammation, such as cytokine, reactive oxygen species generate during inflammation, such as by cytokine or agonist activated immune cells that can directly oxidize lipids include the hydroxyl radical, hypochloride, and peroxynitrite, and of course, nitrogen dioxide. In contrast, exo, remember this is the EOX, excuse me, that's the enzymatically oxidized phospholipids results in a more stereospecific restricted set of products formed through a control pathway because it's enzymatic in innate immune cells, for example, like the oligodendrocyte. Both pathways are functionally similar during chronic inflammatory diseases. So you have the non-enzymatic, which is common to both of these pathways, right? This is the stage here. And then you have the enzymatic stages, which are specific for, for example, fatty acid chain length. So the enzymatic oxidized phospholipids are mediators of cell signaling and generate during innate immunity, so they're naturally produced, to limit bleeding. I told you they're involved in the clotting mechanism and infection, which is, of course, often what occurs during this initial phase of the innate immunity. There's going to be some kind of microorganism there and it's trying to block the innate, uh, uh, to block the infection using in the initial phases of innate immunity. They're also generated at higher levels in disease, full-blown disease, and they contribute to a vascular inflammation if not checked. So non-enzymatically generated oxophospholipids are always considered harmful because they contribute to autoimmune and inflammatory disease and cell death without any checkpoint control, without any control over enzymatic turnover, which is no longer being offered when you have a non-enzymatic event. Okay, so both things are 
can become problematic, but particularly the non-enzymatic one can. This comes from the paper we're looking at by uh, these authors here, Science Signaling, again, just published. All right. So what kinds of free radical product, products do we talk about? There's the monosubstituted, such as the hydroperoxides, the hydroxies, the keto functions, epoxy, very common, and also nitroalkanes, okay, it's the saturated structures. Then there's the polyoxygenated, which we were looking at just recently there, last slide, dihydroperoxy, dihydroxy, hydroxy, and hydroperoxy, ketohydroxy, these are where there's, there's couples of these two types of oxygenated species in one molecule, Hyd hydrohydrins, nitrohydroxies, ozonides, isoprostanes, F2 isoprostanes, E2, D2 isoprostanes, epoxy, and isothromoxanes, and also to a lesser degree, isoleucotrienes. These are all oxygenated fatty acyl derivatives from polyoxygenated derivations. You also get chain shortening that can occur. This becomes really critical when we talk about the molecular species of the oxyPLs, okay? So you get omega aldehydes, omega carbon carboxyls or carbonyls, omega aldehydes and gamma hydroxyls, omega carboxyl gamma hydroxys, omega carboxys, etc. You also get furan rings forming of butanoils and alkanes and butenoils and alkenes. So that's some of the chain shortening that goes on of those long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids. Okay. So again, this is again showing you here is iron associated with epoxygenase making the alkyl or alkoxy radical here. Uh, there's your delocalization generating from addition now of this reaction uh, with molecular oxygen, producing the pyroxyl radical here. Here's an alkyl radical here that can generate via delocalization this patterning down here, okay? So you get a direct oxidation of membrane phospholipids and achieved by, again, as I showed you in the last slide, hydrogen abstract, or two slides ago, hydrogen abstraction on the SN2 carbon fatty acid, uh, SN2 uh, bond configuration on the fatty acid. Usually that's arachidonic acid, uh, and which is an omega-6, followed by oxygen insertion and reduction, thereby releasing a phospholipid hydroperoxide, which is right here, okay? That is reduced ultimately, so you get reduction of that compound because it's very toxic, uh, by a glutathione peroxidase, isoform 4, to form a phospholipid hydroxyl, which I told you is completely uh, benign, right? There's, that compound has causes no further oxidative damage, basically, basically an endpoint. So there's an indirect oxidation of phospholipids by the Lanz remodeling pathway, uh, which occurs when phospholipase A2, this is shown down here, hydrolysis, again, of a fatty acid, uh, of the two position of the fatty acid on a glycerol backbone, releases a substrate for oxidation by lipoxygenases or cyclooxygenases, forming an oxylipin. Now, this is going to be what looks like a free fatty acid, but usually it's a sterified coenzyme A, and that's what you see right here. You form a coethioester because these fatty acids don't exist long in the cytoplasm, and then you have an acyl transferase reaction, and those acyl transferase reactions can occur either. Uh, on the entire lipid molecule, or uh, sometimes with a misfunction oxidase reaction in between, and then you make these exophospholipids this way. So this is the Lanz remodeling pathway, and this is more like the de novo oxidation pathway. Okay, so both both systems are functional. These are just acyl transferase reactions here. So a common oxophospholipid class in vascular lesions, of course, is going to be phosphothalocholine because it's a common membrane phospholipid, phosphoglycerol lipid. Oxophospholipids, the excess formation promoted inflammation, driving atherosclerotic vascular tissue. That's one of the things that causes tissue damage. Atherosclerosis generates oxyphospholipids, specific immunoglobulin M. Okay, that's the one that's associated with the membrane on, say, a a B cell or a plasma cell, and the levels of those antibodies, which are going to be fixed on the membrane of a B cell, are inversely correlated with disease, thereby providing vascular protection by sequestering those oxyphospholipids. So once they bind, they sequester them, and that's why there's an inverse relationship there with the level of the immunoglobulin M bound to, now you remember, the B cell or the plasma cell. 
Molecular species involved could be one palmitto wheel, for example, two 5 oxovalerial. See that chain shortening went on. S English O3 uh, phosphatidylcholine, otherwise known as PAWPC. You also get one palmitto wheel, two epoxy isoprostane, and S English O3 phosphatidylcholine, or PIPC. Uh, and finally, you get palmitto wheel, two glutoral, uh, glutoroyl, excuse me, S English O3 phosphatidylcholine, or PGPC. Uh, and they form all in vivo. And they're assumed to be generated non enzymatically, because I just showed you there is a pathway for that. But lipoxygenase and cyclooxygenase might catalyze the initial oxidation. Okay. And that is going to form, of course, lipid hydroperoxides. If antioxidants are, if antioxidants are depleted, then all of those lipid hydroperoxides could be non enzymatically oxidized to lipid radicals, as we saw in those two sets of reactions, which would then propagate, right? leading to racemic downstream oxyphospholipid formation. Okay, racemic meaning both, um, uh, both, both forms. But the biosynthesis of enzymatic oxyphospholipids is regulated as it's mediated by enzymes that catalyze redox chemistry. During biologically produced oxyphospholipid formation, the molecular oxygen is inserted into a polyunsaturated fatty acid group to generate those lipid hydroperoxy uh, compounds yielding specific regio and stereoisomers because it's enzymatic. And those are going to be uh, termed enzyme oxyphospholipids. Several cells of the innate immune system generate them through cell type specific lipoxygenase and, and cyclooxygenase isoforms, right? Depending on if they're um, a 5 uh, or 15, for example, or 12 uh, in their stereo configuration for those specific enzymes, those oxygenated enzymes, oxygenating enzymes. There are two distinct mechanisms for enzymatically oxidized phospholipid formation, direct oxidation of an intact phospholipid, as I told you, or an indirect oxidation in which a preformed oxidized fatty, uh, oxidized fatty acid is inserted into a lysophospholipid through the enzymes of that Lanz remodeling system, which is looked at, but via those acyl transferases, right? Direct enzymatic oxidation of phospholipids is, is catalyzed by 15 lipoxygenase human or 12-15-lipoxygenase, murine, those are where this has been studied, both encoded by the LOX15 gene, uh, and it's found in leukocytes. 15-lipoxygenase is highly expressed in human eosinophils and interleukin-4, interleukin-13-treated monocytes. That will generate free 15 hydroperoxy tetraenoic acid, or 15-HPET which is then rapidly going to be reduced to move it out because it's a highly toxic compound because of this oxygenated form of it uh, by cellular glutathione peroxidases to the more stable 15 hydroxy icosa tetraenoic acid, 15 HEDs. Right? Unlike indirect oxidation, enzymatically oxidized phospholipids generated by the 15 LOX or the 12 15 LOX are present in unstimulated cells, so they're there already. And their formation doesn't strictly require agonist activation of any kind, suggesting that some of them play homeostatic roles in what? Innate immunity, because it's an innate immune response, remember. Phospholipid hydrolysis by phospholipase A2 to release fatty acids. Formation of that oxofatty acid, typically on a or prostaglandin, by fatty acid oxidation, catalyzed by so cox. Actually, these are oxygenations. Uh, then finally, reesterification of the oxylipin uh, to lysopl to form enzymatically oxidized phospholipids by the coiligase. Okay, this process occurs in platelets and neutrophils, where fatty acid oxygenation is primarily catalyzed by the 12 blocks, um, encoded by that gene or by the 5 blocks. Second pathway in which you get these phospholipids may occur through indirect ox oxygenation involving a sterification of a precursor oxylipin that has been taken up by different cell types. And that process is called, as you might guess, transcellular uptake. Mm, big deal. Human platelets can rapidly form about 100 different unique forms or structures through those two enzymatic pathways after thrombin activation. The most abundant are phosphatidylethanolamines. Those are the parent phospholipid. Although phosphatidylcholine forms are also prevalent, and rare, you also get phosphatidylinositol forms. 
N-formal peptides, uh, FMLP, such as N-formal uh, methionylleucylphenylalanine, are actually potent mediators for inflammatory reactions. And those stimulate a membrane bound. Those are probably um, some form of an epitope that you might find associated with a bacterial membrane. That's why they turn on this system. They mediate inflammation. Uh, and then they activate the phospholipase activity, which then generates the free fatty acid where it can be oxygenated. And that's, of course, necessary for the cascade of events we just went through. Free acid eicosanoids work via G protein couple receptors signaling its sub molar concentration. So they're very, very potent. Um, heat EPLs, remember those are the hydroxy ones, mainly exert their effects through low affinity interactions with proteins and or by altering membrane electronegativity because of the hydroxyl group, uh, leading to changes in how proteins interact with membranes, such as in the blood clotting mechanism. So the biophysics here is differential and the mode of action it's thus geometrically expansive because you have a hundred different possible varieties of these isoforms. You get the idea here. So what's the immunological function of oxyphospholipids? Macrophages directly activated by a crude mixture of air oxidized phosphatidylcholine, no enzymes, change their phenotype so that both enzymatically oxidized phospholipids and the, the non-enzymatically one, formed ones might drive inflammatory vascular disease in vivo. So even when it's enzymatically oxidized, just exposure to more molecular oxygen, which is air oxidized, right, can lead to a further production of various molecular species, all of which can have pleiotropic effects. The 15 locks derived hydroxy eicosatrienoic acids or tetraenoic uh, acids uh, linked to phospholipids increase in abundance in monocytes, uh, again, innate immune cells incubated with type 2 cytokines, such as IL-4 and IL-14, uh, which induce that enzyme, which induce lipoxygenase, and they're detected in type 2 inflammation. Those physicians out there know what I'm talking about. 15, 12 um, hydroxy eicosatetraenoic acid phosphatidylethanolamines, that molecular species, are expressed on the surface of resident macrophages. Uh, where they facilitate clearance of avitotic cells, as I said very beginning, but during active uh, uh, during active uh, inflammation. Hence, sorry about that doubling of those words. Hence, the hydroxy eicosatetraenoic acid phosphatidylethanolamines facilitate a silent waste disposal, right? Where they don't they don't allow any of the uh, generation of toxic cytosolic. Uh, compounds to be bled out into the extracellular space. So without those uh, those things as autoantigens enables maintenance of self-tolerance. That's one of the ways also of teaching lymphoid cells. Okay. So enzymatic oxidized phospholipid formation is required for ferroptosis. The formation of phospholipids with long polyunsaturated fatty acid change is facilitated by that um, uh, acyl-CoA uh, ligase reaction, then oxidation of phosphatidylethanolamine to form hydroperoxides is mediated by the 15 lipoxygenase. Okay. Lastly, iron dependent, lip, this is why it's called ferroptosis, ferro iron. Lipid peroxidation during ferroptosis involves insufficiency and shutdown of auto oxidative enzymes like the glutathione peroxidase isoform 4 and lipoxygenase mediated peroxidation that at least partially involves 15 lipoxygenase. So this just came, again, from this paper. So you got phospholipase A2 activity, making the free, for example, arachidonic acid. You get coenzyme A esterification to it. Now it's a metabolic play. So you have an arachidonic acid coa thioester that can be transferred to a lysophosphatidylethanolamine. Then 15 lipoxygenase can function in the presence of iron, making, again, these hydroperoxy radicals, that's what's shown there. And then if if you have glutathione peroxidase, these get quenched down the hydroxy derivatives, and you get controlled lipid peroxidation, which is what you want for an innate immune response. But if you lose, right, if you lose the synthesis of glutathione, which is what happens when you block that XC cysteine uh, antiport system, because you lose the ability to take in cysteine, 
which is a dimer of two cysteine molecules, and you need cysteine to make de novo glutathione. If you don't have glutathione, the glutathione peroxidase doesn't work because it needs glutathione, right? It's the ultimate reductant here because it gets oxidized, right, to GSSG in the process of what? Reducing that hydroperoxy. So if that doesn't happen, the hydroperoxy retains, you get uncontrolled lipid peroxidation. That leads to ferroptosis, right? That, that is a program cell death for sure, but it's one that exposes all the cellular, con the other cells to the cellular contents. So it's a messy thing. And that can then induce more uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, migration of other immune cells, including innate immune cells, and ultimately triggering, triggering an acquired immune response by bringing on T and B cell lymphocytes. So see, ferroptosis is much more dangerous than can cause, again, necrosis. If this is happening in the central nervous system, you get neurodegeneration. Right? So I heard a paper that published in Blood in 2009, just to get an idea about the expanse of this going on. Both the heterogeneity and cellular transformation plasticity are molecularly emblematic of the monocyte macrophage immune cell lineage. So you get different types of cells generated, and those different types of cells also have a, a, a different molecular um, signature. And those molecular signatures will lead down different immune pathways. Okay? So you get heterogeneity of individual cell types, but that also leads to those cell types going through a transformation. And that transformation is a, is a plastic environment, is a plastic, it occurs within a plastic environment. That is, it occurs and stays with the cell, right? Neuroplasticity. Only here it's neuropathoplasticity. So both microbial stimulation, such as LPS, and subsequent cytokine release, which occurs, allows for mononuclear phagocytes to acquire distinct specialized and polarized capacity. It's all innate immune response. Indeed, upon inflammation, monocytes will transform into immune stimulatory dendritic cells, which can also act as antigen-presenting cells. Okay. Oxyphospholipids are formed by free oxygen radicals, as we said, during inflammatory response, where they guide functional differentiation of monocytes into those dendritic cells. Such oxydendritic cells now have a diminished ability to produce interleukin-12 and to stimulate T-cell proliferation upon stimulation via the TLR, okay? So that's the toll-like receptor engagement process that normally occurs during bacterial invasion. Oxyphospholipids inhibit phosphorylation of histone H3, enter epigenetics again, <clears throat> They inhibit the phosphorylation of histone H3, a serine residue there, and consequently the accessibility, because it's on histones and histones associated with chromatin, of the interleukin-12 gene, that is the DNA for that transcription of that gene, accessibility for the RNA polymerase I'm talking about, leaving other signaling events like activation of the, so you don't get interleukin-12, rather you get NF-kappa B, which is a transcription factor for further pro-inflammatory activity of those cells. So oxyphospholipid mediate inhibition of the histone phosphorylation, okay, hence suppresses the dendritic cell-derived interleukin-12, and that blockades detrimental Th1-driven immune responses at sites of inflammation via an epigenetic mechanism. That's all epigenetic is phosphorylation of histones. Indeed, in another system, oxidized phospholipids on lipoproteins, now phospholipids found on lipoproteins, not covalently, of course, induce epigenetic reprogramming, just like here, and an increased pro-atherogenic response in human monocytes. I found that in a paper published in Atherosclerosis 2017. <clears throat> so you get the idea how these phospholipids, these oxyphospholipids, are now acting as agents of change by altering epigenetic patterning by altering phosphorylation and ultimately acetylation of T histones, which are going to be cis proximal to promoter regions, allowing for the transcription of various cytokines, some pro-inflammatory, some anti-inflammatory. Right? 
thus mediating, modulating the inflammation of cells being driven by the oxyphospholipids that can even be carried by lipoproteins. Okay. So let's now introduce diavent ontology to this system. Diavent ontology, or dieventology for short, which is dialectical event ontology, is what I came up with about a year ago in terms of trying to take and harness all the scientific literature on a given topic, like for example, neurodegeneration, and bring it to bear on a, on a, on a d grid which will allow us to take um, a pyramidal axis where there are three points of that axis of a pyramid that can derive interactions of whatever the core of that pyramid is in terms of a molecular phenomenon. Okay, so it's trigonal planar inactivity. That's why I chose to make it look like that, and you'll see in a moment. So it is an adaptational, processive, scientific accounting. That's what my diet event ontology is, accounting of the physiological, rational human condition through cellular and molecular event ontology. It includes the rational aspect because it involves choice, because choice involves agency, and agency moves the individual through its biochemical environment. You see. All right, now it's biological mechanism of action linking such things as pathopsychological states, for example, like Alzheimer's disease, to biochemical pathways, canonical indeed, and it incorporates the immunoepigenomic, we just were going through there, just glanced by it, induction of neural, endocrine, and metabolic responses to the micro and macro environment, micro, internal, macro environment, for example, that oxygen containing in, uh, air, through classical or uh, bacterial infections, viral infections, uh, fungal infections, right, or uh, ischemia reperfusion, all of that, right, uh, endocrine and metabolic response, environmental issues like that through classical constitutive surveillance from the immune system, like the innate immune response, and acquired, this would be lymphocytic now, effector cellular and humoral defense stratagems using reversible because epigenetics has to do with acetylation, deacetylation, phosphorylation, dephosphorylation, same with methylation, same with ubiquitinylation, right? So they're reversible processes. Covalent, and they're covalent modifications, and even hydrophobic interactions like at the membrane level like we showed you there when you don't have the glutathione peroxidase functioning of nucleic acids, proteins, and lipids. Right now we're looking at all three, actually, in the system we're describing. If we're looking at transcription, we're looking at membrane phenomena, we're looking at protein-protein interactions. So diaventology offers a general molecular system theory for a free will-driven, agency-based individual adaptation and knowledge-acquiring physiological and rational mechanism that better explains core event ontology of human existence, including health and well-being. Because we all know as we get further and further into biomedicine, that each individual, right, the individual genome, the individual environment that interacted with genome, generating an individualized immunoepigenome is to that individual. So part of all that system, again, has to do with um, systems working in time and space. So they are eventual. Right? They're not substantial. They aren't substances. They are entities working through time. And that's why I want to bring this paradigm shift into uh, biology. I want to talk about di dialectical understanding, where we're not dealing with opinions, but we're dealing with the consequences of predicate logic to devise good hypothetico-deductive and hypothetico-inductive reasoning to generate experiments and describe them subsequently, and then to use that kind of experimentation to develop event ontologies, that is, looking at experimental results, and then verify those results, those event ontologies or evidence, and try to understand what the system is doing in real time and maybe project into the future. Okay. So here is a current model, one that is 
purposely one that's always in motion for Alzheimer's disease. So this is my diaventologic type uh, 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 stage two for the event ontology Alzheimer's disease. So let's take a look at this. Again, prim, primitive planar. So you've got Alzheimer's disease in the middle being acted upon by the genome, the environment, and the ep immunoepigenome. I want you to remember that living systems interact according to a pseudo three-dimensional biological trigonal planar, trigonal planar, there's the triangle and there's the plane, okay, of opposition, just like the square of opposition that you meet up with in logic studies. So you have a universal affirmative, no harm to individual, maximum benefit, rare or occasional epistasis, genes interact with one another. Universal negation, severe harm to the individual, 100% epistasis, genes are interacting all the time. Particular affirmative, some benefits to the individual or disinterested epistasis where the genes are interacting, but in a non-canonical way, or if you want to put it a different way, in a um, stochastic format. Right, so that the genes that are interacting aren't necessarily ones you would think are interacting, or their gene products aren't necessarily ones you think are interacting. For example, LOX and COX working with for oh, uh, the movement of phospholipids on the surface of lipoproteins, generating a, a, a traveling molecule like an E oxyphospholipid, which can trigger epigenetic and immunoepigenetic phenomena wherever. So that would be a disinterested um, or uh, epistasis, disinterested meaning non-partial, depending wherever it docks. Or ultimately, you can get a particular negation, some harm to the individual, and you get a predicated epistasis, where because of the specific molecular structure, you get specific consequences and sequelae. So let's take a look at the three um, underlying features of genome and environment and epigenome. Genome, for example, if you're talking about um, Alzheimer's disease, has the um, amyloid precursor protein. It has the neutral and, of course, the acidic sphingomyelinase. It has ceramide synthase. These are all from the previous talks from Verovmed lectures that you can go back and look at and from my Authentic Biochemistry podcast, which you can go back and listen to. Um, beta and gamma secretes, secretes, secretases, which involve on processing of that precursor protein. Tau protein making fibrillary tangles, ApoE4 bringing as cargo things like oxyphospholipids into past the blood brain barrier into the central nervous system. And that XC pathway, which involves cysteine out, glutamate out, which can be perturbed by things like uh, excess glutamate, which can be triggered by ischemic, ischemic reperfusion. You also have other genomic things which are more difficult to define in terms of Alzheimer's disease, but do play a role. IQ, adipose, equipose, like what is the level of adipose in the system and whether or not the obesity is involved. And maybe there is even some kind of gender bias in Alzheimer's disease. We're starting to look at this more and more. And indeed, some of the prodromal faces favor female over male, depending on what, uh, what draft of pathway Alzheimer's disease will go into. So these are all sort of things that are much more nebulous, but they are genomic in their ultrastructure or are architectonic, if you will. The environment has a lot of things going on, aging, inflammation, cardiovascular disease, a, a disease already there, infection, which is different from inflammation, of course, stress, lots of different stress, such as psychiatric stress, loss of a loved one, for example, sedentary lifestyle, okay, obesity, which are not the same, Education seems to play a role. The more educated people are, the more they're using their mind, the less likely they are to develop all prodromal Alzheimer's disease earlier in their age after 65. This has been seen time and time again. We don't understand how it functions. It might have something to do with IQ, but it does have something to do with the learning process, which doesn't surprise anyone because learning requires a reorganization of the central nervous system at the epi-immunogenomic level. Okay. Um, intellectual avoidance, that is not utilizing your brain, but just for example, uh, when people get older, they stop uh, using their higher level, they stop using intellectual um, interactions, and they move more and more than just having a sedentary lifestyle again, not challenging themselves intellectually. That seems to be a, 
have a negative effect. That is, it has the positive effect on Alzheimer's disease, but has a negative effect on long-term outcome towards death and being free of neurodegenerative disease. Alcohol and drugs, definitely bad because they increase and have been shown to link to higher levels of Alzheimer's disease early on, more full-blown. Glutamate, which we talked about extensively already, uh, plugging up this XC pathway and also causing uh, excitatory toxicity at certain neural synapses. The iron ferrotopsis pathway we looked at and the transfer, pro, uh, the transfer pathways out of that inner mitochondrial membrane. Those are all environmental issues. In terms of the immunoepigenome, microglial activation, astrocyte dysfunction, which we talked in previous lectures, oligodendrocyte malfunction, we just talked about, B in plasma cell recruitment, we're talking about the IgM pathway, for example. I didn't talk about the IgG system, but that's also something that's inherently involved here. T cell differentiation modulation has to do with T cell receptors and co receptors and that phenomenon, which we're going to talk about later. Cytokine chemokine growth factor modulation all over this entire immune pathway. And now just briefly brought in oxyphospholipidin, that brand new paper just published. It was so cool that paper was published, I was able to incorporate it into this lecture. It wasn't going to be there, you see. That's also part of what I try to do in uh, all of my event ontological discussions, including my Vera Med lectures and my authentic biochemistry. If I find something that looks like it put, comes together what I'm talking about, I will go to that, even though it's a brand new paper and I'll dissect it. That's what I do with you this afternoon. Uh, microRNAs, these are the cell epigenetic phenomena, sirtuins and histone acyl transferases. Um, there's also methyl transferases, DNA methyl transferases and DNA DNA methylases, removing methyl. And these are all things in the micro uh, epigenome, which we, which we have talked about over again and again in the Verif Med lectures and even somewhat in authentic biochemistry. Okay, so I'm ready to say goodbye. Uh, hopefully it didn't last too long. And hopefully you got something out of this this time, like I hope you do every time, actually. Um, again, this is a combined lecture from my uh, Verif Med um, uh, background and also from my new podcast, Authentic Biochemistry, which you can pick up on any podcast platform. Hopefully you've been listening to those. I think I've made four so far. I'm getting better at podcasting. I think I'm already pretty good at these video lectures, but I'm again trying to like overlay each of those. So you, do, you don't necessarily have to listen to one or the other, but they do complement one another. So I encourage you to both watch my Vera Med lectures and to listen to my authentic biochemistry lecture. Eventually we'll make some of the authentic biochemistry also video and we'll get some guests. There's my Facebook. You can find all of this on my Facebook, including some um, uh, Western philosophy, including epistemology and metaphysics, which I use in all of my discussions in molecular sciences, particularly in biochemistry is what I am, a lipid biochemist. Again, that's me. That's my email address. You can contact me about any of the material I put out there on the internet. And I'd be glad to discuss this with you. And also, if you have a topic you'd like to discuss, I'd be glad to entertain it with you. There's the Vera of Med uh, signature information, which you can take a look at. Again, we're verifying published evidence in medical biosciences where the Vera of Med comes from. That's where the logo uh, was designed. So with all of that in mind, uh, and with hopefully a good parting company uh, in the middle of this week. Uh, again, you can see actually it's now the 27th of March. So that paper was published yesterday. So it's Wednesday, the 27th of March, 2019. To put a timestamp on, you can even see that it's 4.20 in the afternoon Pacific Standard Time. So you know exactly when this is happening. So let me um, end with my end note uh, and uh, final signature for all the things I tried to do. And that is to say a very warm bye.